Well, fermentation is an ancient ritual that humans have performed since the beginning of history. Yet the population today is largely scared of the term fermented food. It's most impossible to avoid fermented foods if you like pickles, vinegar, wine, cheese, beer, the list goes on. Well, today we are joined this morning by fermented revivalist and guru Sander Elix Katz to break down the stigmas around fermented foods. He's also going to teach us how we can ferment in our very own kitchen. Well, welcome, Sander. Thank you so much for having me, Absolutely. Jackie. And then you've turned our kitchen into a science project, which is <laughs> a lot of fun. I've been excited about this all week. Um, how did you get involved in fermentation, and what is it about wild foods that pickled your interest? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I mean, basically, my uh, interest in fermentation grew out of gardening. The first year that I was gardening, which is maybe 26 years ago now, um, I was such a naive city kid that it never occurred to me that all the cabbage is ready at about the same time. So the first year that I was gardening um, and I had a nice row of cabbage, I decided to learn how to make sauerkraut. I knew that I loved sauerkraut. I couldn't believe how easy it was to make sauerkraut, how delicious my homemade sauerkraut was. And you know that sort of led me down the rabbit hole and I became obsessed with all things fermented and learned how to make bread using a sourdough. I learned how to make yogurt. I learned how to make wine. Um, and um, you know, I mean, many, many foods and beverages that people love are products of fermentation. They sure are. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't realize that and that's a great that you had that background. So what is it about science that's helping to ferment foods? Well, um, I, I mean, so what fermentation is, is the transformative action of microorganisms. And of course, we didn't know about microorganisms until uh, Louis Pasteur's work 150 years ago. So people have been, you know, fermenting for at least 10,000 years, according to the archaeological record. Um, but we've only known, you know, about these microscopic agents of fermentation, the bacteria and the, and the fungus that are actually transforming the food since the birth of microbiology. So, you know, microbiology has really been giving us great insights into fermentation, but I really think it's important to reassure people and make them understand like you don't have to know anything about bacteria or microbiology in order to ferment safely uh, and deliciously at home. And I know that it's so good for you. We're going to get into that shortly. But what is the difference between uh, pickling with vinegar and fermenting? Okay, so uh, 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 fermenting and pickling are overlapping uh, uh, um, uh, uh, categories, sort of like a Venn diagram. And so all kinds of things are fermented that are not pickled. Wine is not a pickle. Um, uh, uh, bread is not a pickle. A pickle is anything preserved in an acidic medium. And one way to do that, really the old world traditional way to do that, is to ferment the vegetables in a salty environment and lactic acid bacteria create lactic acid. Um, uh, using vinegar, you're taking a product of fermentation, vinegar, which is acetic acid fermented by bacteria from alcohol, and then you're using that acid, usually in a hot solution, to preserve vegetables. They, they both can be effective at preserving. The reason I prefer the fermented uh, uh, vegetables is because, well, they're more delicious, uh, mm. uh, and also they have this probiotic uh, uh, aspect where, you know, eating them is, you know, ingesting billions of bacteria that can, you know, help to uh, diversify uh, uh, the bacteria in the intestines and potentially improve digestion, immune function, um, and, you know, many aspects of our health. Okay, and so you've described some of those. What are some other benefits, and why should we be doing it every day? Well, sure. Okay. okay, I mean, you know, fermentation describes a lot of different kinds of foods, and, and, and some of them have these live bacterial cultures if they're not cooked before you eat them. But in all of them, the nutrients get broken down, pre-digested. So, you know, proteins get broken down into amino acids, the building blocks of proteins. They become more accessible that way. Uh, uh, chemical bonds that can make minerals in foods inaccessible to us are broken down. So we get more minerals from the food. Uh, um, uh, lactose that so many people have a hard time digesting gets broken down. Even gluten, the wheat protein that so many people have a hard time with can be broken down, not by a yeast fermentation, but by a bacterial fermentation such as you find in sourdough bread. Wow. So there, there are a lot of nutritional advantages to fermented foods. Love that you have that scientific background to, to let us know. We're gonna get into this a little bit later. We're, what are we gonna be making? We only have okay, a couple we're, we're going to be fermenting vegetables, which okay. is really, you know, was my gateway to fermentation, and I recommend it to most people as the sort of easiest and most straightforward way to begin a, a fermentation practice. And so I'll be uh, uh, shredding a little bit more cabbage and carrots and then uh, uh, talking to people about um, 
how to, how, how to turn those into sauerkraut, kimchi, uh, other delicious fermented vegetables. All right, and then you're going to show us all that in a little bit. We can do that at home oh. after this demonstration. Absolutely. So stay with us. All right, if you're interested in doing your own home fermentation, we'll pick up one of Sanders' in-depth books on fermenting. His website, wildfermentation.com, is a great resource to home fermenting. And for his upcoming events, you can also attend a number of his classes all over the country. Join him this weekend while he's in Denver. And we're going to be back with more from Sander Katz later on in the show. Well, we're back in the Cocoa Kitchen with fermentation revivalist Sander Alex Katz. We're welcome back to the show. We've prepped our veggies and we're ready to start the fermentation process. We've got your ingredients ready to go. So what, what goes into this process? Okay, so basically you can use almost any vegetable for this. What we've used here is cabbage and some carrots and I shredded the cabbage and grated the carrot, lightly salted it, and then I got in there and I was been squeezing it with my hands. And what this does really, we're, we're trying to get some juice out of the vegetables because we, we wanna get the vegetables protected by their own juices from the free flow of oxygen. Okay. And this is the, you you know, kind of selective environment that we create when we're fermenting vegetables. And so the squeezing basically breaks down cell walls and helps release the juices. And I do that until I can pick up a handful and go like that, that and it's nice and juicy. And then we know when we pack it into the vessel that we're fermenting it in, we'll be able to get the vegetables submerged under the juices. That's really incredible because when you think of a carrot or a piece of cabbage, you don't think of that much moisture in there. And look yeah. at you. A little bit of salt and a little bit of squeezing um, uh, releases uh, juice from any kind of fresh Vegetables. And is it pretty typical to use your hands when you're doing this process? Well, I like to use my hands. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's it's it's, it's fun. It's tactile. <laughs> um, you know, certainly in commercial settings, people often wear gloves. But um, you know, you clean your hands beforehand, and I think it's perfectly fine to use your hands. Okay. Uh, I've actually brought some of my um, uh, six-month-old uh, uh, sauerkraut made with daikon radishes well, and napa cabbages. Um, if you'd like to have a have a I taste, I do like me some sauerkraut. Okay, so while great. I'm taking a little bite, let's talk about you know how to uh, manipulate the flavor a little bit so people don't get into a rut with these flavors. Yeah, well, I mean, you can vary the vegetables. I mean, really, any vegetables can be fermented. Um, uh, today, we put a little bit of uh, uh, caraway seeds uh, uh, in this kraut, but, you know, you can use garlic, you can use chili powders, you can be experimental and do curry kraut or, or other seasonings. Um, I mean, you can really mix it up in terms of what vegetables, how they're sliced, how you season it, and then, of course, the final variable is time. Mm -hmm. Because if you ferment something for a week, you're going to have something very delicious. If you ferment something for six months, you're going to have something with a much stronger flavor. So the yeah. acids accumulate over time and, you know, nobody can tell you how long to ferment it because it depends on what kind of flavors you like. Okay. If you like stronger flavors, longer time, shorter flavor, uh, more mild flavors, yeah. you can ferment it for five days. You can ferment it for a week. That's great. And some people prefer the milder flavors. So this was six months? This was six Sour months in my radishes. cellar, yeah. You know, there's a great crunch to it and a really uh, a mild um, sauerkraut flavor, and I love sauerkraut, so mm. I'm, I'm all in. This is very, very good. Okay, I really like beautiful. it. All right, so let's talk about where the bacteria comes from and some of the health benefits yeah, around sure. fermenting our food. So, I mean, the bacteria, especially when you're talking about something like sauerkraut, is coming from the vegetables. So cabbages and carrots and all vegetables have lactic acid bacteria. In fact, all plants growing out of soil on planet Earth are believed to be host to uh, uh, lactic acid bacteria. So, um, you know, the, the process for creating sauerkraut doesn't require adding any kind of a bacterial starter. It's just creating the environmental condition that will allow the bacteria that we want that are already there to um, um, flourish. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's basically adding a little bit of salt, getting the vegetables juicy, and getting the vegetables submerged. Nature has given us this yes. food, and, and yes. so it's so great what we can do with it. Now, I know you said you started this early. You, you learned at a very young age all the, this whole process. So what were some of your early experimentations? Well, I mean, my, my earliest, my, my gateway into fermentation was sauerkraut. And I, I mean, I certainly recommend that to other people. I mean, what I've learned sharing a, a, a fermentation with people is that many people approach a, a fermentation 
fermentation with great fear because we've been taught to be so fearful of bacteria. Yeah. Um, you know, many people look at something like this and they say, you know, how can I be sure I'm going to have good bacteria growing in my jar of vegetables and not something dangerous that might make me sick or even kill somebody? <laughs> um, and so, well, the way you know is that there's no case history. Like, there are no known cases of food poisoning or illness from fermented vegetables in the United States or anywhere in the world, according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Very good. And so, I mean, basically, if there happen to be cells of some kind of pathogenic bacteria, salmonella, E. coli, uh, other kinds of bacteria, as the lactic acid bacteria acidify the environment, they destroy them. Mm -hmm. So there's no chance for survival of any of the organisms that we would associate with um, illness in people. So it's a very, very um, kind of elegant and, and self-protecting um, kind of a process. I tasted this a moment ago just to evaluate the saltiness. I typically don't measure the salt. I just I just lightly salt it and then I I just, you know, mix it around and mix it up and then taste it and, and it tasted just fine. I, right. I could always add salt uh, if, if I wanted it to be saltier. There's no magic number. Sometimes I think people imagine that this is a highly uh, a technical process and I mean it's possible to make it without any salt. That's great. Look at you packing that all in there. This is very, very educational and I know you've got some classes coming up this weekend so tell us about those and how can we can attend well sure I'm in town for an event called slow food nations um, and I'll be doing a uh, like a, a more extensive demonstration like this uh, uh, tomorrow Saturday at 7 p.m. at Larimer Square okay um, I'd also uh, uh, refer people to my website uh, wildfermentation.com where uh, I have recipes uh, upcoming workshops information about my books um, and all kinds of fermentation related uh, uh, resources. So, so this is it. You just get it in the jar, submerged under its own juices, leave a little bit of room because as it comes alive, it's going to be bubbling oh, and expanding a little that's bit. That's right. Very um, and cool. Yeah. We have a special top that can release the the carbon dioxide without letting in air, or if you're using a typical uh, you know jar top at home, what you need to do is just loosen it. You know, uh, for the first little. few days, every couple of every, every couple of days, just every, every every day or so, loosen it to release the pressure. Press down, make sure the veggies get submerged. It's Very so nice. simple. Very nice. A great garnish for any entree. And, Thank and in you. terms of how long, taste it. Just taste it periodically, and if it gets as strong as you want it to be, move it to your fermentation slowing device, your refrigerator. There you go. It's to your preference. Yeah. Sander, thank you so much. You can pick up any of Sander's books for his in-depth, simple guides to do-it-yourself fermentation like what you saw today. Attend his workshops. You can watch his live demo tonight at 7 p.m. in Larimer Square. That's tomorrow night in Larimer Square. And you can find him at Slow, Nation, Slow Food Nation events all weekend long. His website, wildfermentation.com is a great resource for recipes, tips, troubleshooting, and so much more.